Thank you for coming back. Our next oh, yeah, talk right. is uh, bringing Fedora Linux to Apple Silicon Max with as a high <coughs> Linux. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Gompa. Uh, this is Davida Kalvika. We're here to talk to you about how we brought uh, Fedora to Apple Silicon Max. Um, and so this is a blurb about us. You can figure it out later. But uh, we do, as you can tell from the we, list, we do a bunch we, of stuff. We do a lot of stuff. Yeah. So um, a little bit about Fedora Asahi. So it kind of starts with the Fedora Asahi Special Interest Group, which is the group that packages and maintains software used to support um, Apple Silicon Macs on, uh, on Fedora Linux. And so we develop and maintain variants of Fedora Media for Apple Silicon platforms. We also do all the hardware supporting software and things like that on top of it. Um, of course, the primary deliverable of our special interest group is the Fedora Asahi Remix, which is a special derivative of Fedora Linux that's optimized around Apple Silicon as a platform. So this includes core changes like having a custom kernel that has all the Apple Silicon enablement done, um, packaging for the various applications and services and having them configured to work out of the, out of the box, and of course, having a Fedora Asahi Remix branding for this. And the Remix comes in various flavors, notably KD, GNOME, server and minimal. So the flagship experience being Fedora KDE. Uh, of course, because Fedora KDE is the best. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a partnership between the Asahi SIG and the Fedora KDE SIG. And it includes essentially the same experience that you get with Fedora KDE on x86 and generic ARM, um, as well as other platforms. Um, but it aims to also include some of the enhancements that you need for having Apple Silicon uh, platforms work correctly on it. So little touches like the fact that the brightness controls work and stuff like that are things that we've taken care of and things like that. So other than that, it's the same experience you would get with Fedora KDE on an Intel platform, on an AMD platform, on a generic ARM platform, SBC, whatever you pick. That's what we're running on the demo laptop over here. Right. So this is a MacBook that's running Fedora Asahi Remix with KDE. Then there's, of course, you know, a polished experience with GNOME. This is a derivative of Fedora Workstation. It does the same thing that you would see on Fedora Workstation on Intel platforms. AMD platforms, blah, this whole thing. Like the same thing I said for KDE, same thing for GNOME. The idea is that the experience is basically the same, whether you are using upstream Fedora uh, Workstation or KDE, or Fedora Asahi, uh, GNOME, or KDE. And then we have the special flavors of the server and minimal ones. This is because there are some people who want to use it for headless things, whether they're trying to do weird cloudy things on Apple Silicon hardware, or if they just want to do stuff like use a Mac Studio as a render box or whatever. Like, it, it, people do stuff. We provide a way for people to do the stuff. <laughs> so, all right. I want to hold the end. You want to go for uh, that? Yeah. Uh, so, this started with the Asai Linux Upstream project, uh, which uh, around end of 2020 started with the goal of starting to port Linux to these platforms. Hector Martin started the project. He quickly raised funds on Pantheon. Uh, the goal was met very quickly, and there was also momentum around the project. Uh, it was announced at the end around Christmas and very quickly started yielding, yielding results. By the end of 2012, we had an, al they had an alpha release out uh, based on Arch. 2021. 20, Dan, your slide is wrong. No. Uh, <laughs> no, it isn't. By early 2022. Oh, oh yes, yeah, that's the that, alpha. You said 2012. That's why I was right. Oh, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, what? Good. Did we, did, did no, we no, get no, a time machine? No, no, We did not go back in time. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the, a lot of the effort here was around acquiring the hardware initially and then doing the work to support various components in the hardware. So we started with basic platform support and then getting all the various devices within the platform supported and the GPU and everything else and so on. Yeah, a big part of the fun here was making sure that, you know, taking the Asahi patch set and applying it on top of the Fedora kernel, rationalizing all the configuration, making sure the resulting kernel works. That yeah. actually took a fair bit of time in itself. Uh, the Fedora work started at the end of September 2012, and we built the Fedora images using 22. Kiwi. 22. Yeah, there we go. We'll never get this right. <laughs> uh, and that's the um, Kiwi is one of the many image building tools that are available, uh, which we, we chose because it made this very easy and streamlined, also because Neil likes it. Well, I work on it. <laughs> yep. And as of today, we have pro support for, I would say, almost all Apple Silicon devices that are on the market. Uh, we have full support for laptops uh, up to what exists now. We have support for desktops up to 22, uh, up to last year, not this year. <laughs> These year models are still work in progress. Uh, we support up to the latest firmware. 
Uh, firmware on this system is provided by MacOS, so it's coupled with the MacOS version. So we support up to the firmware provided by uh, with 13.5. Uh, we have hardware accelerated graphics with GPU. That thing is running, I think, GLX gears because that was the quickest thing I could find, but I can run Open Arena or whatever, uh, and it works. Uh, the camera works, the, the stupid touch bar works. I was actually surprised about how well the stupid touch bar works. I, I, I would recommend, if you get one of these, I would recommend one without the touch bar, but the touch bar does work. I was impressed um, personally, because this is the first time I've seen it, because he's the one that's had the touch yeah, bar Mac. Um, uh, the touch bar actually works surprisingly, uh, surprisingly nicely. Uh, even the alt, you can't really see it here, but like normally you get function keys, and if you use FN, you get modifiers, so you can like, do brightness controls and stuff. So it actually works uh, like you think it should? Yes, in, in a useful way. Things that are still in progress. Um, the, main, the main ticket item I, that a lot of people ask about is audio support and speaker support. Right now we get audio out if you either use Bluetooth speakers or if you plug into the headset jack. Sometimes. Um, no, that works. Uh, the um, speakers are in progress uh, and being actively worked on. Uh, the trick with the speakers is that these this hardware, in, the, in this hardware, there is a lot of software components related to getting the speakers to work right. And if you just drive power through the speakers, you can easily blow them up, uh, which we don't want to happen to people. So there is a lot of work around making sure that the audio enablement is done in a way that is safe. So no matter what you play through them, your machines won't blow up. Uh, yeah, so for comparison here on Intel platforms, the same kind of thing happens except that there's a chip in between the, the audio stuff that goes out through the speakers and your computer operating system that does the limiters. So you can't really break them. Uh, yeah, no, that doesn't exist on Macs because, well, Apple doesn't really need them. So they don't have them. So we need to make them. Um, other, other things that are in progress, um, audio over HDMI, uh, Thunderbolt uh, is to be worked on it with that display port. That's why actually we're presenting from, not from this laptop, because the video out from this one uh, would go through the USB-C and the display port out mode, and that isn't supported yet. Um, but it, it is, does work with Mac Minis. We've done presentations before using a Mac Mini. Uh, yeah, we did that the, the one HDMI, at Flock. Yep, the one at Flock works. So the HDMI out of the Mac Mini works and is well supported. Uh, my daily driver at home is actually a Mac Studio M1 uh, that I use with, um, with a, over HDMI, and that works perfectly well. Uh, and then other things like Touch ID are still being figured out. Uh, yeah, so as part of doing um, this work for Fedora Asahi, upstream Fedora, uh, uh, the Fedora KD SIG and Asahi folks and, and you know, Davida and I and all these other people, we've done a bunch of related things that have built up to providing the quality experience that you have now. So like, I know a couple of years back when the pipe wire craze kind of started, like, you know, that all started in Fedora. And a big part of this change to Pipewire was to bring the pro audio capabilities to the baseline Linux experience. And that was critical for being able to get any kind of possibility of working audio on Apple Silicon platforms. Um, another aspect is, well, all Apple Silicon displays are HDR. And they are, uh, they are very, they're custom. They have strange resolutions in the sense that they're not configurations that you typically see on PC laptops. There's uh, all these other features that really only work properly in a Wayland environment and not really in an X11 one. So a lot of work went into getting things shifted over, the default experience, making sure everything is actually working properly in the Wayland environment. And oh my God, beating my head over to make uh, all, everything work in Wayland out of the gate from login to shutdown. Yep. Uh, that, was, that was actually a lot of work. So we did that over the course of two years leading up to this. Um, and of course, the other little things like, well, let's make sure Chromium doesn't crash when you try to run it on a 16K, you know, ARM CPU and stuff like that. And, the, you know, you see these little fixes littered throughout the stack. And again, Fedora Asahi, in, in many respects, is one of the first major exercises of doing desktop Linux at a, at a reasonable scale um, on the ARM platform. And so we're seeing a whole lot of things that people haven't really exposed before. Like, of course, you could do this with Raspberry Pis. The Raspberry Pis were slow, are slow, still slow. And so there are a lot of, ex and your expectations are much lower with an SBC like a Raspberry Pi or an Orange Pi or a Pine 64 or a Rock 64 or whatever. Well, when you're using a professional grade laptop that's actually got PC quality specifications and has a real PCIe bus and it actually has RAM that's not bad, like you, you <laughs> actually tend to expect the computer to work really well. And you, we start seeing things like, my gosh, race, race issues and timing issues and stuff like that, fixing all these little nits that nobody ever noticed before because we just didn't have you know, the hardware to make the software break, Be, uh, which is a weird thing to say, but it is absolutely true. Like when the hardware is at a sufficient level and then you change those expectations, 
Well, then the software responds in a way that you don't necessarily expect. And fixing all of those was a big part of what's been going on for the past couple of years. So right now, DSI Remix is the flagship distribution um, that is produced by DSI Linux Project in collaboration with Fedora. The official beta release of this is out now, and you can use it. If you happen to have an Apple Silicon Mac, you can go on fedorasiremix.org. Uh, there is a one-liner there that you can run from the macOS side that will uh, download the installer, run it, uh, resize the disk, download the image, lay it on disk, tell you how to perform the dance to boot the machine in recovery mode so you can put it in the right security state so that Linux can boot, and then boot Linux. Um, and then it just works like a normal Linux system that you'd expect. Uh, this is in beta right now because we're still working out all the latest thinkings, and as you had mentioned earlier, there's a bunch of features that are still not quite well supported, like the speakers. Um, it will be released soon. Um, um, but right now, there's images out for Fedora 38 and 39. Um, yeah. I would probably use 39 if you're, uh, yeah. if you're installing one now. Please uh, use 39. 39 is not officially <laughs> released for Fedora yet. Yeah. Um, and a lot of this work, though, has been not necessarily just working on the enablement for the platform itself, but getting all of these pieces merged upstream in the relevant projects. Uh, especially on, uh, on the hardware enablement side, if all we do is do this in like downstream in forks of the kernel, forks of MISA, forks of U-boot, and it stays there, this is just going to rot away and eventually disappear and not going to be useful. A lot of the work here has been actually working with the kernel community, with the U-boot community, with MESA, on doing the changes that are needed there and also working through, uh, if the subsystem doesn't map exactly to what the hardware should do, design and rework how it should be changed so that there can be better support for the systems, but also for similar systems in the future. Uh, and at the same time, uh, while we do have a few packages that we maintain as deviations as part of the SIG, uh, because for example, for things like Mesa, we're still tracking a very bleeding version of Mesa compared to what's provided by Fedora proper, we want as much as possible of this to, f uh, to like, feedback into the stock Fedora packages. So at some point in the future, you should be able to take a stock Fedora Linux image, not a remix image, and lay it on a machine and have a useful result. Yeah. It probably won't work out of the box on like the very latest model, because maybe that enablement won't be integrated just yet. But if you have, say, like a Mac Mini uh, or like an M1 class machine, it should give you a good experience there. You shouldn't need to do anything special. Eventually. Not right now, but no, eventually. not right now. And this would also help with other distributions for what it's worth. So if, you, if you'd rather not run Fedora, but run like Debian or Ubuntu or whatever, this will help with those efforts as well. And so, yeah, um, this has been uh, an adventure in the past couple of years of an adventure. We're, we're still doing a lot of good stuff. We're ramping up to having our official stable release. Um, you can, you know, if you want to help or if you're interested, like come and join us, Fedora Sahi Remix. And you can check out our project tracker, our forums, Matrix. That's where we're all hanging out there. Um, if you aren't into code or whatever, all that stuff, but like you'd still like what we're doing and would like to support us, um, you can support Hector, uh, representing the Asahi Linux project on GitHub sponsors, or myself, representing the Fedora Asahi Remix and the Asahi SIG, also on GitHub. And the other folks that are in there, that you can see more on asahilinux.org slash support. <laughs> Check it out and, uh, you know, give it a shot. And if you have any questions or if you want to play with the demo or whatever, we'd be happy. Yes? Very, er, very simplistic Linux user, but how are you able to get away with this given that Apple is very tight-lipped about running other OSs on their systems? So there's two parts to this. Um, Apple actually built facilities into these machines to allow running custom code. This is baked into the firmware, and the firmware you're able to essentially tell it uh, run to, to run a custom object, which in our case is the Linux kernel, in a different security model in a way that doesn't impact macOS. So that was built in the design of these systems. Um, so clearly they weren't against the idea. Uh, and on the other hand, you do that by reverse engineering for the most part. So you run. Yeah, you just you, figure it out. You run, <laughs> so you run macOS in an hypervisor, you look at what macOS is doing. And then you translate that on the Linux side. For every given you, for every given button push you do, you see what what goofy stuff happens on the other end, and then you try to write a code that replicates the goofy stuff, and there you go. Yeah. Or you work by inference because that might be similar. Like say the Wi-Fi card might be similar to the one in another type of laptop, so you can make assumptions there. Right. Sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's goofy stuff. Sometimes it's well, it just works because everyone kind of expected it to, so it therefore does. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's a little bit of all of this. Yeah. Yes. Have you guys been able to do anything with uh, the CIE expansion on the Mac Pro at all? Or oh my gosh. There is <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so if I remember right, Hector got initial brain cup for the Mac Pro going in like a lab setting. Uh, it's not at a stage where it's usable. He also um, found out that the controller is not is but, definitely not the way anyone wanted yes, it to be. Yes, the, the Mac Pro is a <laughs> odd system, so it's unclear how useful in practice this will be. Because uh, my understanding is, for example, you can't actually put a GPU in there because of limitations of how they implemented PCIe on the device. At the at, hardware level, there's nothing yeah. nobody can do about so that. So it's, it's unclear, of, like, I guess if you want a lot of NVMe controllers for some reason, that might... I don't know if it could even do that, because I think it was also power bottlenecked and all yeah, kinds the, of other fun stuff. I, it's, it's weird, but yes, eventually we'll get there too. It, Honestly, I see there's been like other priorities, I would say, because I don't think a lot of people would have a Mac Pro in the first place. But like, I, yeah. I, I honestly, like, I kind of wonder who wants a Mac Pro and the Mac Studio's got the same hardware and is like a sixth of the cost, literally. Yeah. <laughs> Our, yeah. It, it's a weird use case, but we have a ton of the new Mac Pro specifically for SDI, XLR, AES connectivity. Sure, okay. Oh, oh. And production. Yeah, I suppose uh, like the fact that you could have so much more RAM and a larger memory. Thing yeah, I, I can see. Yeah, yeah, for like video production yeah. work like that, I can see that making sense. Yes. Is there any effort being taken to reverse engineer the firmware so we don't have to get that directly from Apple? No. Uh, <laughs> so there's a couple of reasons for this. The first is they're all signed, and so that's a whole that like. It, I just have to refer to NVIDIA, and you will all understand why we why the fact that it is signed is a no. Um, the second is um, we shouldn't really care because of the in the same way we don't care about PC firmware. Like every Intel PC has like somewhere close to what 300, 400 megs yeah. of firmware that you actually need to initialize the drivers and and actually use it. Like. Most people aren't aware that this is a problem we actually have also on x86 machines, on power machines. I don't pretend to understand Z, but it's also weird there too. Um, but like you, you don't, ha you're going to have this problem no matter where you look. Um, and in our case, because we can just kind of piggyback off of what MacOS gives us, we don't really have to think about it, and we pr really don't want to. Also, this is firmware in the loose sense. So it's things like the calibration data for the camera, for example, that. Is something that you really have to get from from the hardware because it's specific to this, this system you're running on. Or the color profile like for initializing yeah, the monitor. Yeah, color profile. Or, <laughs> uh, a lot of these tends to be specific. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, or like very use firmware for various auxiliary processors that run on the machine alongside the main one. On the flip side, it means that this is the first set of Macs where Wi-Fi works out of the box. That, that is true, <laughs> yes. Yes? What about an iPad? Is that, is that a possibility? Is there a demand? So iPads, uh, I, as I mentioned, these have a facility that lets you run arbitrary code on them by design. iPads do not. iPads are locked down, so unless somebody were to find a way, a way around that, um, there, there's that. There's that. Besides all the other like hardware support, because it is, it is a different platform. So even if the core CPU might be the same, uh, everything else will be different. So it will be a significant endeavor. The rules of ARM still apply. Yeah. Uh, yeah, these so, are embedded system of, <laughs> systems after all. Yeah. Uh, I've learned recently that uh, you know, it's hard to fix your own Mac screen because it's so hard to put into that specific system. Yep. Uh, does that present any challenges or opportunities in regards to the project? Or is it just totally um, that's largely controlled by a C firmware blob that we're not touching. And so um, I can't say yes or no because I have no idea and I honestly don't kind of don't want to know. Um, it, it's really a set of problems that are just kind of really out of my personal range of things. Um, I would like it if there was potential or opportunities to be able to do interesting things on that front. My personal guess, again, with no real data or information about anything, this is the wild guess here, um, the answer is probably there's nothing we can really do. Yes? So my first experience was a Apple Silicon Mac was uh, a uh, laptop, and I was surprised at how much better it worked from a laptop of a few years ago with the x86. I mean, it powers on immediately. It you know comes wakes up from sleep. You know, everything just on it mm. works yep. so much better. And did you guys see a similar? Yes. Uh, yeah. That, uh, that is partly like why. This project is so interesting that for the first time, 
in a long time, this is kind of like a, a step function in like usefulness and quality and everything. So did you guys take it beyond the um, Mac OS experience? We're, we, so to give you an idea, like this thing can already reach like, I think it's like eight, nine hours yeah. uh, on battery. We haven't done a lick of optimization yet. Uh, <laughs> we, we've like, no optimization, it's on par, maybe slightly worse than Macos, and there's a lot of room for optimization. Uh, and this was like, before we did not even have a power management driver for this thing, so when we it went just to got sleep, the power management it stuff. just blanked out the display, and it looked like it was sleeping, but it was just running. Uh, and it still lasted hours without any trouble. Now we have an actual CPU idle driver and everything, so it, yeah. uh, it goes properly to sleep. It does. Are you keep? Are you? Do you think you're going to be able to keep up with the their step changes and you know the, the third I, generation? I think so. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, a big thing that I think people kind of forget is that Apple is still a computer company, and that also means that in order for all these people to build stuff to run on these computers and they have to support them in a multi-generation way with the same software, they don't actually want to just change everything for the sake of it. So a lot of times, the differences between the revisions of the platform are relatively minimal. And so adapting to new ones sometimes, most of the time, is just we have to write a weird device tree thing to say, OK, this is a new model of these mapped to these pins and whatever. And then everything lights up. I think initial bring up for the M2 was Hours yeah, it was uh, of the like very like demo, and then like a week to get it to a useful state. Yeah, uh, it's it, it's gonna be in that order, I think. One thing that is irritating to me is that the, every time they change the OS annually, you know, there's something weird. You know, and I, I would just love to have a stable system year yep. to year. Sure, and uh, also, I mean, the in, for the Fedora Sahi, we don't currently recommend that you or, or possibly ever. Uh, recommend that you get rid of MacOS because we need it for getting the firmware and a couple of other things. But um, you don't have to use MacOS after that. Like you could just keep living in Linux land and it'll be fine. What, what's the what's you do? So you have a dual boot up? Yeah. So the, yeah. Uh, this uh, is a multi-boot computer. We have the time. All I the, can boot it and show you. But this by default, this boots in Linux because it's hey, the, the the boot picker is set up to boot in Linux. Uh, but if you push this button, it goes into the boot picker and it will boot. Um, it will give you a menu, you can choose what to boot. So this is going to go through the boot flow now, and it will boot Linux by default, uh, if I set it up right, I think. I think you did. We'll, see, we'll find out. Yay. I did change it to boot to macOS when I flew, because I figured if I had a Mac running Linux explaining that to DSA, <laughs> it would be fun. Um, but yeah, it went to uh, Mini, and then U-Boot, this is U-Boot, and now it's loading uh, the image, and it will boot the kernel in a minute, and then it will come up. Um, I think this still has the old image that has like a five second pause there, so that's why it takes a while, but it Very could cool. be faster. And it comes up. There we go. Also, um, in the span of him bleeding out a sentence, we just rebooted the computer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, let's see if I can show this quickly. Shut it down. And like it's all fancy to the point of like, you know, so if you limit them stuff, all the flash, the flash stuff that works. Yeah, it goes continue pressing for boot options. Loading boot options. And this will give you the boot picker when it comes up. Which, by the way, is a stripped down version of MacOS. Because because they chose to make MacOS their thing, firmware. So everything is MacOS on these things. So like when I was at Flock, I, I, I like kind of bleed out a sense where it's like, yeah, so yeah. We're, start, we're booting up MacOS to start MacOS to start Linux to start MacOS to start Linux again. Yeah, so here you can choose <laughs> MacOS, uh, Fedora with KD, and the other one I had here was Fedora with GNOME. Uh, let's put that one for a change. Sure, you can show uh, off the other one. I, hadn't, uh, I haven't actually updated this, so we'll see what comes up. Uh, yeah, I encourage us to, to move forward for our next one. Yes. Yep, yeah, sure. One last question. Are you, are you uh, getting, I, I know that the Raspberry Pi was you know, vastly underpowered, but the Pi seems like a credible machine now, and they're, they're going to be running you know, Linux on ARM. Are you getting any feedback from them? Nope. Um, no, in my understanding is that you can't actually get the five yet. At least that's what they told me when it's I. The, it's, I think it starts on Monday. Oh, are they shipping them on Monday? Yes. Oh, oh Monday we'll see. We'll see what happens then. All right. <laughs> I mean, the other thing about the Raspberry Pi that's sort of unfortunate is there isn't anyone actively, at the, as far as I'm aware, and I'm an ignorant right. person who doesn't really follow the embedded board scene anymore because 
it depresses me. Um, but uh, there isn't really anyone actively pushing for the Raspberry Pi platform enablement to be upstreamed into mainline that all the distributions could benefit from. Raspberry Pi OS has still a lot of functionality that's only available there because they're just not pushing it back upstream. For example, like the camera stuff, the, the, the video codec engine stuff, um, some of the power management stuff, some of the uh, networking fixes, like all this, you know, bring up stuff that's important. It's, it lives downstream in the Raspberry Pi operating system and they haven't really been doing anything to push it up for everyone else to benefit from it. So like, it's the opposite of what we've been doing. With that, we are out of time. Okay. Feel free to grab us if you want to chat. Yep.